Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome, or as the case might be, welcome back to CG. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for um, a very special conversation with uh, Ambassador Bruce Heyman, U.S. Ambassador to Canada. Uh, before I introduce uh, the Ambassador, let me give you a quick sense of what, how the afternoon will proceed. We thought, and at the Ambassador's su suggestion, uh, we're grateful for it, that we would simply have a conversation with him and, and, and uh, not have a preliminary talk. Uh, as a result, many of you have been kind enough to fill out one of these, which have been passed to me, and there's also an audience on the web that is tuning in, which will be sending in questions which will kind of come to me. So if someone walks up, it's not that your my tie is crooked. <laughs> it's just that we're being given, we're being given questions from, from the web audience as well. Um, the other thing I should say is it, it is said that of diplomats eat and drink for their country, but in this case, we haven't even fed you or, or given you a glass of water, so feel free, and we're all doing this for you. Keep that is in that mind. Is that a strategy? Before we talk, you don't <laughs> give me anything to eat yet? Or? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of one of those medical tests, I think. Um, in any case, welcome again. Um, there is a detailed bio of the ambassador on the event website. Uh, by all means, take a look at it. Uh, for the purposes of this venue, uh, let me just make two or three points. Uh, Ambassador Heyman presented his credentials to the Governor General almost exactly two years ago, April the 8th, 2014, uh, and so has been in this country since then. Previous to that, he spent 33 years with Goldman Sachs, and uh, when he left, was heading the private wealth management group based in Chicago. Uh, and as such, covered several American states and also several Canadian provinces. Um, close to CG's heart, uh, he has been a board member of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, with whom we have had very many fruitful connections here at CG. And he has degrees from Vanderbilt University, with which and with whom he is still active. So, Ambassador, welcome. Thank you. Again, to glad see to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of questions that have been asked about uh, the campaign and where it has been and where it might be headed. Uh, what? There's a a campaign is going on? How well, we speaking of that, there's even a question about how high you think the wall might be, but we won't go. Um, no, no, no. Right there. But, but I guess the point is, um, Help us understand what you can and cannot say as a diplomat and how you see the campaign unfold as the U.S. representative to this country. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much uh, for taking time out of uh, all of your busy schedules to uh, join us today for a conversation. And thank you for hosting me here today. It's, uh, I know, been a long time in coming, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, so yes, there is a campaign taking place in the States, and there isn't a place in Canada uh, that I've traveled, and I've traveled to all the provinces and all the territories, but there isn't a place or a corner of this country that somebody doesn't pull me aside with a question or a statement. Um, <laughs> but that all being said, um, the role of a diplomat uh, is one where we represent the entire nation. And so we have 320 million people, we have 50 states and territories, and it's our responsibility to um, not be involved in politics. Um, and that is not only a responsibility, it's the law. So under the law, under the Hatch Act, um, US diplomats are not to participate um, in promoting, in um, advocating for, or endorsing any candidates of any party. And so with that, I take, um, take that quite seriously, as you can imagine, but also, you know, I have e extraordinary confidence in the American people. And I really believe that through this process, and we're in a process, um, at the end of the day, the American people will make the right choice. And, uh, and we have a system in place that will work well with Congress, the Supreme Court, and the executive branch and I would say the Canadians, you should not worry about these things. Um, 
And, uh, and I mean that in all seriousness. It, regardless of who occupies the White House or 24 Sussex when it's occupied, um, <laughs> who, uh, whoever occupies uh, either location, it really doesn't um, impact the broader, deeper relationship we have uh, together, which are going on hundreds of years now. So that's been, uh, that's the flavor of a number of questions, which is the sense, especially in scholarship, that US-Canada relations have a structural element that's longer term than the political cycle. That's correct. Give us a sense of what are the three or four big preoccupations uh, of yours on, on the US-Canada front that you think uh, are stable no matter who is in power, either in Ottawa or Washington. So when I, when I arrived here, we really sat and tried to think through the priorities that we'd have out of Ottawa. And uh, by the way, not only are we in Ottawa, but we have seven consulates across the country. Um, our Consul General Juan Halsase is here uh, from Toronto. Uh, but we work across the uh, entire country, and we sat down and tried to prioritize um, the key things that we would be working on during my tenure here. So let's just run through these real mm -hmm. quickly. Uh, first and foremost is trade in the economy. Uh, Canada is our single largest trading partner uh, with 600, this last year, $671 billion worth of bilateral trade in goods and services. Um, second, energy and, and the big word is and, the environment. It's not an either or, and we really focused on um, talking about and working with our largest ener energy partner, uh, we buy more energy uh, from Canada than from any other source outside of the United States, uh, whether it's oil or hydroelectricity um, or uh, uh, natural gas or renewables, and we even buy a fair bit of uranium uh, uh, from the country. Uh, third, um, multilateral um, uh, activities in which we work on together. And I would say, give you examples, what does that mean? Um, working together on the coalition to counter Daesh, uh, working together to fight Ebola, working together um, in NATO, uh, working together on any multilateral effort, but this was really important because Canada actually is involved with almost everything uh, that you can think of, whether it's in outer space, in the space station, in the Canada arm, to everything here the, across the world. Um, fourth, that would be cultural diplomacy. We really work very carefully culturally, and we, we share in each other's riches of uh, music and entertainment, uh, but not only through music and entertainment, whether it's through film, whether it's through artists. Artists have a way of addressing issues um, that are hard to talk about, um, but we can do it through either documentary films or through art or through performance. Um, and then finally, focus on the border. We have over 5,500 miles of a shared border together, nearly 120 border crossings, of which 400,000 people on average cross every single day. And what's important is that that border function well. And when I mean function well, that it is thin for the things that are good. Travel, goods and services that we trade with each other and it's appropriately thick for those people that could potentially do harm to either of us. And on that last point, uh, there was a question from uh, someone on the web who wrote in and asked, uh, given all of that, and it's a $2 billion a day border, I'm, I'm told, uh, what are we doing uh, to improve the thinness and decrease the thickness without compromising, as you said, security? Um, so I would say that um, uh, the Prime Minister's visit, which was, by the way, we can, if we get a chance to talk a little bit about it, the state visit, um, which was one of the most memorable um, points in time of my life. Uh, but that wasn't just a nice dinner, which it was, uh, but it was a, a deliverable day for a series of outcomes that we worked on bilaterally over months together. One important component of that was to talk about our border. And it broke down in a couple of categories. Uh, first and foremost, um, we have an agreement that we have between each other. It's called a pre-clearance agreement. You all benefit from that by going to the airport, checking directly into the United States right here in uh, Pearson, down the road just a bit, and flying anywhere you want in the United States because you've already cleared U.S. Customs here in Canada. 
We actually do this in eight locations in Canada, which is the largest of any country that we do this with around the world. Uh, we reached an agreement to expand that and to add um, potential, once passed by Parliament and Congress, which I'm confident will happen, um, we'll add Billy Bishop, we'll add um, Quebec City, um, we're gonna add Train um, in Montreal and Rocky Mountaineer out west. And so this new agreement takes those airports and expands it to land, rail, and marine, and so really enhances the border. But in addition to that, we agreed on sharing information with each other, such as no-fly list and um, entry-exit information. You see, when you get to the border and you're driving, say you're driving to Buffalo, um, we know that you entered into the United States by going through our customs, but Canada doesn't actually know you left, and vice versa. Um, and so we had agreement a long time ago to share the information was just never actually implemented. And so we agreed to begin implementing that. Mm -hmm. So a number of things. I actually think it will enhance uh, the ease of travel. Uh, it'll enhance uh, the security at the same time. Yeah. On, on your first soft bucket of issues, economic, you mentioned $675 billion of trade annually. Uh, and just, I'm, I'm sure the audience knows this, but. Uh, the next biggest for Canada is China in the 75 billion range. So, you know, that's despite all the talk about diversification, and I know my colleagues have written about it at CG as well, this is still the predominant economic relationship. Um, on TPP, I'm struck by the fact that we now have, I assume, uh, two candidates, Democrat and Republican, who have expressed strong reservations about it. Uh, Japan has also, for domestic political reasons, expressed reservations. There is now a process of consultation in this country, which there barely was some, some months ago. Where do you see TPP going? So um, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, what is this? It's 12 countries. We've come together. We've signed an agreement to work on a trade agreement together. We've worked on it for five and a half years, negotiating the various aspects of this agreement. It represents 40% of the world's GDP, 800 million people, about a quarter of the global trade that is taking place. The opportunity set is quite large. I would say that from the president's perspective, we are looking to the Pacific for uh, substantial growth um, opportunities uh, for the United States going forward. I know that Canada and others are also uh, looking to the Pacific for future growth opportunities. Um, we are of the belief that all of us came together and worked on what I believe is the best agreement that could come out of a 12-party working agreement. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident uh, that as we get through the political season and the political rhetoric, uh, that we will find a space to pass this. And so um, I think, though, we have to give it a little bit of time. You know, you have two years to pass it. And, uh, you know, I think that as people sit back, we benefit, the United States, and I say we, the United States and Canada, we benefit from trade. Uh, we benefit from trade globally um, for a multitude of reasons, not the least of which is it's a way to um, lower cost, it's a way to make us more competitive. It opens up new markets. Um, but if we're going to trade, which we're going to do anyway, we might as well uh, reduce the impediments and barriers. And we, uh, there are tons of uh, barriers in terms of doing trade, legal barriers. Um, this particular agreement um, covers um, uh, environmental protections, which didn't happen before. It covers uh, protections uh, for labor and appropriate use of labor. State-owned enterprise, it focuses on that, especially uh, for countries that have larger state-owned enterprises, um, and various aspects of intellectual property. Now, as we go through this, there are gives and takes that happen in agreements, and there are going to be people that look at these, any one of these, from any one of the countries, um, through a lens that might see something that uh, they feel less comfortable with. But I think at the end of the day, this will pass. Um, I think at the end of the day, we all benefit from it. And so uh, I, I still uh, am confident in that. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be, but it, it strikes me that at the very least, uh, the message is not being heard about the benefits of openness and, and transparency and free trade. And we've seen that certainly in this country and during the campaign uh, in both parties, this strong 
Um, what do you think the next US president has to do to bring on side the people who have expressed uh, through their votes and, 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 and actions a profound skepticism about globalization? So why don't we go back and just try to understand what is happening with the broad public and how they feel in general about the economy and their participation in the economy and frustrations that might lead to um, concerns about international trade or anything else. So let's just, let's just go back in time if you, if you would indulge me for just a minute. Um, let's go back uh, to uh, January 2009, uh, President Obama swearing in. I was there. Um, it was a very cold day, um, but it was not only cold temperature-wise, but it was, um, it was a scary time. Uh, the U.S. was losing 900,000 jobs a month. Um, we were, the stock market was plummeting. The financial system was in deep crisis. And we were active in two active wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the president um, was handed the reins and said, oh, over to you. Um, so as time went on, I think that people are going to look back on the president and see that some fairly significant things took place very early on in his presidency to course correct and avoid what I think would have been um, a, a potential depression. We already were experiencing the most significant economic downturn since the depression. Um, so where were we? Unemployment peaked to 10%. Um, it's now five. The stock market, which bottomed March 9th, 2009, has nearly tripled from the bottom. The automobile industry, which was in near bankruptcy, is, re is producing record car levels in output in each of the last three years and looks to be on path to doing that now. The housing market, which was in deep crisis, uh, was in fact uh, now arrested and we're seeing housing stabilize. And so we're in an environment where you have lower unemployment, you have a stock market that's doing well, you have um, automobile industry doing well, you have the housing market, so what's the problem? Why wouldn't everybody think that this is great? Well, the, the problem is there was something else taking place. Um, and this community should recognize that that thing that was taking place was technological change, uh, was happening at a rapid rate. And historically, when we came out of recessions, we would invest and give, you know, um, um, accelerated depreciation to companies, and they go build lots of new plant and hire lots of people. In this particular case, we gave them that opportunity, and they went out and bought technology. And with that technology, plants were able to make uh, product with half, a third, or significantly less number of people. And things are changing very rapidly from a technological perspective. So if you were a factory worker making anything, and you were displaced because of technological advances, and now you have to go to work and make a living, there are a couple of things that are happening. First of all, you may be getting jobs, but you're getting jobs at significantly lower wages. You're also finding yourself lacking skill sets that are needed in this new economy. And if you're older, that makes it even more challenging and the frustration really picks up. You know, where we sit today, while it's 5% unemployment in the US, it's 2.5% unemployment if you have a college degree. So you can imagine what the opposite is if you don't. Um, so where are we? We've got a broad base of, our, of, of the US population that are trying to make ends meet. They're working really hard and they're struggling to do that. While they have jobs and they do that, there are a couple of things that need to be focused on. First, they need new skills and we can work to develop those new skills. But second, we have to recognize that a minimum wage rate of seven and a quarter an hour, which hasn't been raised in an incredibly long period of time, which works out to a normal work week making $15,000 a year, is b below a subsistence level. And so you have a combination of these factors. And the last factor is that if you have and you've watched over a period of time threats that the government might close down if certain activities don't happen of debt extension or budget, I think they became frustrated, and I don't blame a number of people for being frustrated in looking at that part of the window. But I think we'll look back and see we're on an economic path that is, is continuing um, to, to be in an incredibly positive. And the last thing I'd note, coming from the financial world, there's absolute performance and relative performance. In a world where the economy is not doing well, period, full stop, globally, 
the United States is standing out as doing incredibly well. And I tell you, if, uh, if I was an investor, uh, I'd be investing in the United States uh, today, knowing the path ahead. Our companies are as competitive as they've ever been. Our, their balance sheets are incredibly strong. Oh, by the way, we reduced the level of debt that we were um, incurring as a nation. Um, and so I, I am confident in where America is. I think we're on the right path, but we have work to do. And there was a strong element in your answer about strengthening social safety nets, I yeah. suppose, in, in an era of change. And there are a couple of questions about something that Canadians often observe about Americans' view of Canada, which is a strong antipathy to our healthcare system and to some of the socialized ways in which this country operates in, in areas. Now that you've been based here for two years, do you have a sense of where the antipathy comes from, but also a better appreciation for, for how it might make a difference? Well, I don't think the antipathy is toward the Canadian healthcare system in particular. I think that there are, you know, I, I think that there's this balance that's going on, that social safety nets uh, for the less advantaged in our country. Um, there are groups of people that basically feel I've made it on my own and well, I'm a self-starter and I can make this happen. Why do I have to cover for someone else? And then there are other groups of people that say, you know what, I'm lucky and fortunate that I've made it and I have a responsibility to my community uh, to help provide that social safety net. Um, I come from a world where I've been very fortunate and I believe we have a responsibility uh, to those who are less fortunate for circumstances that may be completely out of their control. Uh, Pre-existing health conditions is a, is a perfect example which was tackled by the president um, and how many people with a pre-existing health condition that couldn't get health insurance. So where we sit today, we have 15 million people with health care that didn't have it before. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also a lot of political rhetoric and, rhetoric and positioning, and I would say that Social Security received that back when we started that, and Medicare and Medicaid received that back when it was started in our country, and as time's gone on, these have become um, important parts of the social safety net, I think, that uh, Obamacare will as well. Mm -hmm. You refer to a previous um, career in, in, in your answer. Uh, someone wants to know what's the biggest difference between your current job as ambassador and your previous job? So there, there, are, there are a lot of differences. Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, but there are a lot of similarities. You know, uh, you, you work with incredibly bright people and talented people. Uh, I will tell you, before even becoming ambassador, and I feel I'm, I'm uh, I'm fairly well read and I, I'm up to date on current events and I've been involved in, as you know, a number of policy um, uh, groups that were out, out of Chicago. I did not have a full appreciation uh, what someone who enters the career foreign service, what they really go through, how talented they are, how, how hardworking they are, how much they give of themselves to um, travel and go to different places in the world, some places that are not uh, the safest of places to represent the country. Um, so I, I sit here today having such an incredible appreciation for the people who've committed themselves to this life and to, to our country. But what happened was when I arrived, and this, is the, this was the hard thing for me to originally get my head around, you know, in the business world, if I had a management team and it was really effective and great, I'd do everything I could to keep my management team. And if they were thinking of leaving to go to a competitor or retire or something, it was my persuasion to try, no, 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 you can't go. I, what do you need? What, do you, what, what is it your family needs? How can we help do that? So I arrive here, you said two years ago right now, every summer we lose about one third of the people working at the State Department because they're off to another post. And so as I sit here after this summer, almost every single person that was here when I arrived, just two and a quarter, two and a third years ago, will be different in the State Department at the embassy than was when I arrived. The concept of that mm -hmm. and managing in that environment is something that uh, has taken me a while. I think I'm getting better at it. Um, and uh, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to do this.
It's called regular rotation. A regular rotation. Um, I was saving this question for the end, but, and we have lots of students in the audience. A couple of them asked what advice you have for young people who wish to go into the diplomatic service. Well, keep your nose clean. Don't, uh, don't get yourself in trouble. The background checks are pretty, uh, pretty substantial, and so uh, uh, work hard, study hard. Um, you know, um, the, the, this is a great job. This is a great career, but there, it doesn't come without incredible sacrifice, as I mentioned. And you should sit down and pause a minute and think about the sacrifices that you have to make to the balancing of the dedication that you have. You know, you meet people with a 20 or 30 year career and they've been at 10 or 12 or 13 different posts, picking up families, moving, going to, you know, war-torn areas where their family can't move with them so that they're, they're separated. You have to start um, at the bottom of the pecking order and you have to work your way up. Um, it's incredibly rewarding, it's incredibly fulfilling, but it is a very challenging and difficult career. Um, but I will tell you, there are two things that I learned uh, this last year or two um, that I probably should have known all my life, but it became really clear. So the first thing is, as an advice as a diplomat, would be uh, never underestimate something that you think is so incredibly small and insignificant, how important that may be to somebody else and their perspective. And so take the time to best understand the importance of something that you may not perceive to be important. And the second thing is that two people can actually look at the exact same thing, see it completely differently, and both be right. And so, you know, take time to understand the other person's perspective. And even when you are strong-minded in your debate, and you strongly believe um, of a certain outcome, um, that the other outcome may be equally as good, and fighting for your own outcome may not necessarily be uh, the best path for the partnership. Mm. Um, your second sort of bu bucket of issues when you were talking about your preoccupations was energy, and as you said, energy and the environment. Right. Um, there's a question about the fact that uh, Keystone XL has dominated the discourse, or did for a long part of your tenure. If you had to think to the next two years, what do you think will be the one or two big issues that will dominate the discourse the way it did? Well, I, I, you know, I think it's a mistake, first of all, to let any one issue, no matter how big it is, dominate a relationship so rich and complex and wonderful as the US-Canada relationship. I don't care what the issue is. So was I correct in saying that it did dominate, do you think? Well, or? if you opened any newspaper or any publication or you watched any, if you, you, you just arrived from Mars, you'd realize that this was an important issue. Um, and so we shouldn't let any one issue so dominate this relationship. It's just too important. It's just too important to each other. It's just too important uh, to the world that the US and Canada always maintain um, an incredible bond and relationship and not let things get out of perspective. Um, you should have the confidence that the um, leadership in Ottawa and in Washington can sit down and work through those differences um, and try to find paths of, of both compromise and good outcomes. And I have that confidence um, of working behind the scenes. I just don't think it's necessary to stand on the top of the mountain and start yelling hair on fire on any one particular issue. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, I, I just, I don't think that leads to good outcomes. Yeah. Um, one of the, except among specialists, underappreciated aspects of, of um, the bilateral relationship has been the Great Lakes Agreement. And, and there are ongoing efforts to, uh, to, to make the lakes even cleaner there are winners and losers that come with it. And a, a questioner wants to know, how do we strike that balance between uh, uh, keeping the lakes clean and, and making sure they, that they also provide the economic benefits that they have provided? 
So there's a group called the uh, International Joint Commission, IJC. It was formed, I believe the year was 1908. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a treaty group where it's half Canadians, half Americans, and we work together on dealing with our um, uh, transboundary water issues between our two countries. Um, I have met members of this group. We've had them over to the House for their meetings. They actually get things done. They actually see things through a very similar lens. And so this is over 100 years old, this group, uh, working together. I have confidence that through this group, through our shared uh, work with the environment minister here, um, Catherine McKenna and uh, the whole EPA team and the, the interior team, that we have like um, perspective here. And we are working very hard. I, I view myself as a citizen of the Great Lakes, having grown up in Chicago and, and drank Great Lakes water uh, every day. And uh, my family grew up on Great Lakes water. And now coming here, where we border in Ontario, I believe four of the five Great Lakes, the one we don't border here was the one that I bordered just before coming here. Um, the opportunity set, obviously, is it's about 20% of the world's fresh water. And um, water is an incredibly scarce resource. And as climate change takes place, and we're seeing, you know, and I have to mention um, um, the fires that are taking place even early, very early in the season, but putting people in harm's way. And I, we, we wish, you know, um, we wish the Albertans and uh, well uh, during this, this uh, very difficult uh, fire that is taking place. Um, but we're seeing climate activities taking place and the Great Lakes represent an incredible resource that we have to protect. We have to keep clean, we have to preserve, and it also represents a passageway between our countries. So, I, I, but I don't see that as currently where we are, I see we're pretty much aligned on this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in a relationship as long and deep as this one, are you seeing any innovative ways in which problems are being addressed? Or have we, have we got a style or a system that's serving us well, and so we stick with it? So there are innovative ways in which differences are being worked on, and it's actually happening uh, today in Washington. And that is the, the me those are the meetings for what we call the Regulatory Cooperation Council, RCC. Um, the frustration that I see when I sit down and look at, we have regulations in Can Canada, we have them in the United States. Um, you have your regulatory body, we have ours. And sure enough, and by the way, we have the same interest. We want our food safe, we want our cars safe, we want, you know, we, we, want, we want safe outcomes. That's why we have regulators. Um, but sure enough, one or another of the regulators will get up and create small differences between products such that I think it puts sand in the gears of commerce. Um, we have this, um, what we've termed the narcissism of small differences. We actually, for whatever reason, we love the fact, no, my rule's a little different than yours because, and what, what happens when we do that? Well, when I was with the president of Campbell Soup, she says to me, I can't make soup in Canada to ship to the United States. Why is that? Well, the labeling in the can size is different. Wow. Um, when I talk to a cosmetic company and they say, uh, lipstick, yeah, lipstick. They said, you know SPF, the sun protection factor? Well. In Canada, SPF is a drug and has to go through a different set of approval. It costs $150,000 or more to get approval for a lipstick with SPF versus in the United States, which it's not. Slight differences. Coca-Cola, aspartame written on Coke, the labeling on Diet Coke is different in Canada than the U.S. A baby car seat is different, and if you really wanted to follow the rules to a T, you drive to the border, take your kid out, put in the Canadian car seat, and take him out. <laughs> And so these small differences, um, you know, we can, we can approach this um, in what I call the whack-a-mole process. Oh my God, we have that difference? That's crazy. <laughs> Let's take care of that one. And then another one pops up. And uh, I think that what we're doing now is we're actually talking about tackling this in a strategic way. And stay tuned. I think you'll see some announcements coming out where we're actually thinking more broadly and in ways that I think that uh, will work for both of us and for our sovereignty, 
but at the same time tackle this issue. And oh, by the way, if there are differences that we really believe put people in harm's way or um, you know, create risks, absolutely we should raise our hand and expose those um, and modify each other's regulation. But these regulate rules, um, uh, I think is, is an example of one way that we're actually doing it a little differently. Mm -hmm. And I think, stay tuned, there's more to come. Um, there's a question that asks um, what, if anything, we can learn from the European experience of integration, where the sense is that when you cross a border, you don't, you don't even notice anymore that you've crossed the border. Uh, is that something you can see happening between U.S. and Canada? Well, you know, as, as we share more information, as we get more comfortable with the security side, as we do more things to create processes that understand where the risks are, we will create more outcomes which will reduce that. So from my perspective, we actually have it right now. And for those people who don't have a Nexus card to go to the United States, shame on you. Uh, take the time, even though the process is a bit complicated, that literally with this Nexus card, what we've done is we've pre-screened you. You've done your interview, we've done the background check, both sides. You've done it with Americans, we've done it with Canadians. It's a joint interview process. And you get a card, it says Nexus. Speedy lines, goes right through. I, I'm telling you, it's as thin a border as you could potentially ask for. And I think that that's a perfect example of having a virtual open border as long as we get comfortable with who you are and what you're doing. And not only you, you also need to get comfortable who we are and what we're doing. And once we can get that comfort level, um, we'll give you a card, a, 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 the pass. And so I think we have it. It's just that we're not, we're not taking advantage of it as, as well as we could. Mm -hmm. And there was a related question uh, asking, if Canada takes in more refugees, how would that alter the U.S.-Canada relationship when it comes to these kinds of porous border issues? I commend the Prime Minister for his taking in these refugees. I think it is amazing. It's heartwarming. Uh, I have traveled across this country. I have seen everything from church groups and community groups who are sponsoring families and what they're doing. I think there's a lot that the world can learn from how Canada is doing and what it's doing. And I am not in judgment. I am comfortable with where we are in, in, in developing um, good outcomes for our shared security. Um, we're, we're a land of immigrants and refugees. Everybody in this room, unless you're First Nations or Aboriginal, came from somewhere at some point in time. And in many cases, we were refugees. And so let's not mistake what North America is. My family came into the United States at the turn of the last century, uh, uh, fleeing oppression. My wife's family came in through Canada. And so we both have this shared border understanding. That's the richness of who we are and what we are. And so, um, but we also have to face another reality. There are more than 60 million, six zero million refugees in the world, and we can't take them all in. And so what, we have to find the balance of helping create the opportunity set around the world, which we do in the ways that we do it, such that people don't feel compelled that they have to run away from the countries that they're in, creating the types of stress that we're seeing throughout the world, Europe in particular, um, in taking in so many of these refugees, which is just heartbreaking. Um, and so, but everything's about balance. And everything is about doing the things that, the, that need to be done um, to make sure your society's safe, but also rich and welcoming. And um, I, I, again, commend the Prime Minister and his outreach here. So if my information is correct, a few minutes ago there should have been an announcement made about uh, either a Three Amigos summit in late June in Ottawa and, and therefore the visit of President Obama to Ottawa. Can you tell us a bit more about that? If you... I, don't, I don't know if the announcement was made and I'm definitely not getting in front of the, well, I'm sitting here, so <laughs> I, I, uh, so let's, let's say this. Uh, while I was there in Washington, the president uh, was offered the opportunity to speak before parliament. He is very much uh, looking forward to the opportunity to speak before parliament. Um, there's a long history of having the North American Leaders Summit um, and uh, we look forward to participating in that. 
um, the, the actual day and time and place that that's going to take place. Um, I'll defer uh, to uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and President Obama for that announcement. Try to get me in trouble here, right? Uh, geez. So, are you also going to duck this question? Are Cuban? <laughs> yes. Next are, question, please. Are, are, <laughs> no, I think you'd like this one. Okay. It's a deeper right. question. That are Cuban cigars now allowed in the embassy? <laughs> okay. We have a no smoking policy in the embassy in general, whether the cigars are from anywhere. Um, but uh, Americans can buy Cuban cigars on their travels to Cuba. And bring them back. <laughs> and bring them back. What, there what? is a limit, so please check your limit before coming back. I, I don't smoke cigars, so, but. I, I, I which think is another amazing thing that the president was able well, to accomplish. That's what I was going to I mean, be my next you know, question. We, we open up Cuba, uh, we do a, an Iran nuclear um, agreement, um, that's, uh, the, you sh I, I think in, the, in 20 years from now, people are going to look back, and I believe that Iran nuclear agreement is going to be something that they will look at as one of the most substantial out good outcomes that this president was able to get accomplished in his second term, along with the climate change meeting that brought 200 world leaders together in Paris, um, where the president had a substantial role in cajoling, arm-twisting, convincing, and... Uh, collaborating with uh, fellow world leaders to bring them together on climate change. And on both those, um, do you see variance in what might happen depending on who's elected, or is there also a constancy in, 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 uh, in American presidencies once someone's elected? Look, every president brings his or her uh, nuance to, uh, uh, to an outcome, and, um, you know, that's, that's what will happen. I mean, so they'll, each president... Um, will we'll bring their own perspective, and that perspective will be um, unique for that president. Yet there are other things that are obviously very constant throughout that process. As I said, the U.S.-Canada relationship is firm, and it will remain constant throughout the process of regardless who's president. It's been six months that we in Canada have had a new government. What is your expectation going forward on, on U.S.-Canada relations? Well, my, my expectation, whether you had a new government or not, uh, was that it was going to work and was going to um, be effective. I will tell you that with this new government, um, we have had um, so many interactions, and I'll say in, in really positive interactions. And, you know, it, it helped, of course, um, to work together, first of all, um, going to Paris together um, three weeks after the, the swearing in of... Uh, of this new government. Um, but it also helped that we had a state dinner and we were working several months um, back and forth, having meetings at every level of government, trying to figure out what deliverables we want for a state dinner. And uh, I envision that if a, if a North American Leaders Summit it, it does take place and is announced that we will be doing the same here. The, the level of working um, uh, is, is, is it the highest level you can possibly imagine? To the point, I'm, I'm willing to go out on a limb right now and tell you, and I believe this in talking to people who have been government watchers on both sides of the border, the U.S.-Canada relationship has never been better than it is right this minute. Period. Full stop. That we are having conversations and dialogue at the secretary and cabinet level and at the ministerial level I mean, I had two cabinet-level visitors just a couple weeks ago. Some embassies don't get a cabinet-level visitor for years. Um, we have, and cab uh, in the United States, the president's cabinet, they're just calling, can I, when can I come? When can I? I said, wait a minute, please. You know, some wanted to come to, on the same day, and we, you know, we obviously handle anything, but uh, uh, that goes the other way. Um, with the ministers being in Washington and visiting in Washington and developing personal relationships. So... My expectation is that it is, it is so good right now um, that, you know, there will be some inevitable bumps in the road. Um, but I have the following to say. We can disagree without being disagreeable. And we can find ways to finding solutions to issues. And there's no, there is zero reason uh, to be disagreeable over anything. And I will tell you right now, there's nothing that we're being disagreeable about. Mm -hmm. So this is not the question about 
um, should an issue dominate, because you're quite right that that. What's the single biggest issue Canada-US relations need to address for short and long-term cooperation? Yeah, I, I think that the, the challenge when you have, an, have a relationship that's so deep and wonderful as this is that you pick one thing. But let me start with one thing, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I am going to take um, some significant amount of time over the next couple of months um, to um, learn more about and experience directly. Um, climate change is real, but the real nature of climate change is it's impacting the Arctic. And we, together, are Arctic nations. And so what that means for the Arctic and the change in the Arctic, I think it's happening faster than people think. And that the speed in which that's happening um, shouldn't be, so this isn't now a manana issue. This is a today issue. This is something that we need to focus on. Um, by the way, there are benefits from it as well. Um, but with the benefits will come other challenges, i.e. commerce uh, coming through um, uh, the top of our, of our shared continent here. And how is that going to work? And what is going to happen? And how, how should we prepare for that? Um, and how are we gonna to prepare to rescue people that are doing adventures and doing things up there? And what kind of infrastructure do we wanna have? And the communities of the uh, Inuit and the, and the struggles that they're having. They have struggles anyway, right? We know uh, that they have struggles. Our Eskimos, your Inuit. Um, but now with climate change, the struggles are compounding at a faster rate. Their ice roads are melting. Um, you know, when you open the paper, and I was, had the opportunity to visit Tuk Tuk, um, but when I opened the paper the other day, and they were considering they may have to move the whole town because of climate change. Um, there are gonna be profound implications here. And then what do we do about fishing up there? Well, because now boats get up there. What do we do about natural resources, which are supposed to be you know, in, in large supply, but what are the risks to the environment in that process? So if one thing, um, I would say we should focus on the Arctic and we take it for granted for a long time because we didn't need to because it was just frozen up there and now it's changing. And still on climate change, we, we have a patchwork, uh, both in Canada and the US, when it comes to pricing carbon. We have everything from self cap and trade to yeah. carbon pricing to nothing. Yeah. Uh, I have colleagues at CG who will very eloquently describe how that might work for a bit, but really isn't a long-term solution. Do you have thoughts on what we might do uh, to harmonize um, uh, an approach to carbon? Yeah, no, uh, I think we need to do all the above and the right approach will emerge. So um, a successful approach, but it may be very much that um, different approaches for different provinces and different areas or different states actually are going to have to be implemented. But with the, a similar goal and outcome um, that we're just trying to uh, drive this down. But something else may actually happen on the path to trying to um, mitigate carbon. And it may very well be that innovation and creativity um, make the requirement of all of the rules and regulations and the fighting less important. Um, and so, you know, I, sometimes I read the news for what it is, and sometimes you read the news and step back and say, what is the news telling me? And so if you go back just the last few weeks, and you saw that Mexico City just banned millions of cars off the road because of smog and pollution and it couldn't happen. We've seen that now in cities around the world. So then you sit down and you say, uh, Elon Musk received orders for nearly 300,000 cars of an electric car. 300,000, that, that's like the largest selling individual car that you would sell in the United States. One car, Some, maybe we've reached that tipping point in that. And then you see that um, a solar plane who's trying to go around the world has gone from Hawaii to the coast and came into the United States. And you know, it, it took from, and I'm from Dayton, Ohio, home of Orville and Wilbur Wright. Um, it took just 66 years, and I say just 66 years, it took from Kitty Hawk to Tranquility Base up on the moon. And things are happening at a much faster pace now because of innovation, creativity, and much of which is happening in, in around this community here in Waterloo. I think things are happening so rapidly 
um, that I think that we are now getting to a point where solar and wind and other alternative, alternative energies, which we're not even conceiving of yet, um, are going to displace uh, a large part of our need for fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. Good hopeful note. I'd like to end with sort of two questions. Um, and and uh, the first one is to ask what motivated, you said Dayton, Ohio, what motivated you to be interested in foreign affairs and to be so immersed in them? So I guess we're all products of our parents. My father was always, um, even though he was a son of immigrants, um, first to go to college, a traveling salesman, um, would pack up the car and um, would uh, uh, travel every day, leave on Sunday nights or Monday mornings, come back at the end of the week. And while he was in the car each week, each day, and he'd travel for hours, not drive five hours, six hours to go to the next retail store to sell children's clothes, he'd listen to NPR and talk radio every day. And he knew, uh, for as a child, he knew everything that was going on in the world. I mean, he'd come and tell stories, and he'd come and tell you things about the world and the way it should be, and he was always that way his life, but it, I think it was hatched sitting in the car listening to the radio. And um, I, somehow that, uh, you know, it made a strong impression upon me. And so it was, you know, a combination of his work ethic and dedication, um, a family man that also you know, um, created the, the platform for my life. I have a beautiful family. I've been married 37 years. I married my college sweetheart. Um, but, uh, but also the curiosity about the world, and uh, um, that's where it came from. So just NPR is like CBC without government funding. Would that be <laughs> um, What pieces of advice would you leave whoever succeeds you whenever someone succeeds you? Um, you're the luckiest person in the whole world. You have the single best job in, um, in the United States government, maybe in the whole United States. Um, protect this relationship. Um, protect our friendship. Um, it is so important for us for a very long time um, that we are, we are just relay racers running with a baton that, we're, that you'll quickly hand over to the next. It will go so fast, you won't believe it. Um, try not to say no to things that you may think don't rise to your level. Do everything um, and, and get out and see the country. You are not the ambassador to Ottawa. You are the United States ambassador to Canada, and you should see every part of the country because it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Well, thank you. Um, we've always known that the US-Canada relationship is a special one. Uh, perhaps it's more special uh, for reasons of gravity and size to Canada than it is to the US, but as you said, uh, what, what happens here matters there, and especially vice versa. You've been at the center of that for two years. Thank you for joining us here in Waterloo at CG, and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what? One thing. Oh, no. Thank you. So I, I, I promise I won't make a hockey joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is uh, our embassy hockey puck. It says uh, Embassy of the United States of America, Ottawa, Canada. Uh, it was made in Canada, by the way. It says Canada here. Um, <laughs> But a, a little uh, memory that you can put on your desk to remember this day. I appreciate it, and uh, just uh, a small token of thanks. Well, thank you. And You're it's, welcome. you know, this, a Canadian NHL team will not be touching a hockey puck for some time, <laughs> but this is most appreciated. Well, you know, I, and I do acknowledge, uh, as the Prime Minister pointed out, a lot of our players came from Canada. And so. I, I am deeply appreciative of the trading relationship that we have. Ouch. And your exports are amazing. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Good work. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Brian.
That's very nice. So we're on our way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions, and I look forward to seeing many of you at a future CG event. Bye. <laughs>
Uh, as a result, many of you have been kind enough to fill out one of these, which have been passed to me, and there's also an audience on the web that is tuning in, which will be sending in questions which will kind of come to me. So if someone walks up, it's not that your my tie is crooked. <laughs> it's just that we're being given, we're being given questions from, from the web audience as well. Um, the responsibility, it's the law. So under the law, under the Hatch Act, um, U.S. diplomats are not to participate um, in promoting, in um, advocating for, or endorsing any candidates of any party. And so with that, I take, um, take that quite seriously, as you can imagine, but also, you know, I have a extraordinary confidence in the American people, and I really believe that through this process, and we're in a process, um, at the end of the day, the American people will make the right choice, and, uh, and we have a system in place that will work well with Congress, the Supreme Court, and the executive branch, and I would say the Canadians, you should not worry about these things. Um, and, uh, and I mean that in all seriousness. It, regardless of who occupies the White House or 24 Sussex when it's occupied, um, <laughs> Who, whoever occupies uh, either location, it really doesn't um, impact the broader, deeper relationship we have uh, together, which are going on hundreds of years now. So that's been, uh, that's the flavor of a number of questions, which is the sense, especially in scholarship, that U.S.-Canada relations have a structural element that's longer term than the political cycle. That's correct. Give us a sense of what are the three or four big preoccupations uh, of yours on, on the U.S.-Canada front that you think. So, as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of questions that have been asked about uh, the campaign and where it has been and where it might be headed. Uh, what? There's a a campaign is going on? How well, we speaking of that, there's even a question about how high you think the wall might be, but we won't go. <laughs> Right there, but, but I guess the point is, um, help us understand what you can and cannot say as a diplomat and how you see the campaign unfold as the U.S. representative to this country. Well, uh, thank you. first of all, thank you very much uh, for taking time out of uh, all of your busy schedules to uh, join us today for a conversation, and thank you for hosting me here today. It's, uh, I know it's been a long time in coming, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, so yes, there is a campaign taking place in the States, and there isn't a place in Canada uh, that I've traveled, and I've traveled to all the provinces and all the territories, but there isn't a place or a corner of this country that somebody doesn't pull me aside with a question or a statement. Um, <laughs> but that all being said, um, the role of a diplomat uh, is one where we represent the entire nation. And so we have 320 million people, we have 50 states and territories, and it's our responsibility to um, not be involved in politics. Um, and that is not only...